Well, thank you very much for that, and um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be here today. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and what I'm going to um, start with is the idea that those of you who are moviegoers may have picked up, particularly if you saw Benedict Cumberbatch playing Alan Turing in the imitation game. Um, uh, and I think if you have got that picture of Alan Turing in your mind, then you will know, because movie is fact, isn't it? We all know that. Uh, but you will know, you will know for a certainty that uh, Alan Turing was, uh, to put it mildly, difficult to deal with, uh, asocial, well, at least his social gifts were nil if not negative, uh, and uh, impossible to work with, uncollegiate, uh, no sense of humour, and uh, generally the most difficult person on the planet. So that is the Alan Turing I wish to describe to you, and we will take a sort of a short course through his life, and in particular, I'm going to address the question about where did Alan Turing's ideas come from? I, I personally don't believe the uh, rather remarkable uh, concept that some people seem to uh, adhere to, which is that if you're a genius, then your uh, new ideas just sort of descend upon you as a sort of heavenly gift, and uh, then you can impart them to the world. And they sort of come out of, come out of the ether in, in, in some way. Um, and th those of us who have genius are um, sort of you know, empowered to do that, and those of us who do not have genius stand no chance. Frankly, frankly, I think that's all complete rubbish. We're all human beings, and we all have foibles, and we all have skills, and really, it's all about bringing the best out in people. So clearly, something happened in Anna Turing's life which brought out the best in a rather sort of super and perhaps extreme kind of way. So how did that happen? Where did that come from? Who were the influences in his life? How did he get on with uh, the people that he worked with? So, okay, so that's the sort of direction I'm going to take. Let, let's, let's, start with, um, let's start with his most famous uh, contribution in the field of mathematical logic, his paper on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungs problem, which he wrote in uh, the uh, early 1930s, uh, just after he'd finished his undergraduate degree. For those of you who know about mathematical logic and computability will know that this is the paper that debunked the third and final one of uh, Hilbert's uh, uh, principles about the uh, effectively constitutional rules about mathematics. So everybody knows that uh, a country like the United States needs to have a constitution, which is the rule book by which the rules are made. So, yes, this is different from the legislation that's handed down by Congress or by the state legislature. There has to be a, a constitutional rule book which sets the rules by which the rules are made. And so the question in mathematics was, is there a constitutional rule book which sets the rules by which the rules are made? And Hilbert had these ideas about it. And uh, to cut a long story short, um, uh, there was one principle still remaining in the early 1930s, which is this question about provability. Could you know ahead of time whether it's worth sweating your brains out to try and prove a particular theorem? Can you know ahead of time that the theorem will actually be provable? And if it isn't actually ever going to be provable, then it tells you not to waste your time on it. So is there a litmus test? And this was the third remaining problem, whether there was such a thing. This is the Entscheidungs problem. And Alan Turing sitting there in uh, a set of lectures that Cambridge University was running for its postgraduate mathematicians. Um, it's sort of effectively like a master's program. It wasn't quite like that in the 1930s, but you get the general idea. And uh, so there's Alan Turing on the right. Um, being studiously observed by a rather nosy lady in his hometown in, in Guildford. Uh, and on the left, you've got uh, Max Newman. Max Newman is an unsung hero of uh, not only Alan Turing's life, but of uh, the 20th century generally. He's a thoroughly brilliant individual in his own right. But Alan Turing uh, is being given a lecture on the Entscheidungs problem by Max Newman. And Newman says to 
Alan Turing and to the other students. There's about 10 students in this class, to give you the sort of size of it. Uh, and he says, that there's this question about the Entscheidungs problem, and really what I'm asking you is, is there a mechanical process that you could apply to a theorem to know whether it's provable? Is it something that a machine could do? Newman, when interviewed in the 1970s, just before he died, said, I may even have said, a machine can do it. Alan Turing takes this thought, this is a germ that's been planted in his mind by Newman, and he goes away and he produces this amazing paper. It's his most famous paper. It's, unless you're inclined that way, it's pretty tough stuff to read. Uh, but what he comes up with is this concept of a universal programmable computing machine. And we're so used to this these days that we don't think there's anything remarkable about that. But if you were in the 1930s, it's just the same as having a universal kitchen machine. I want you to imagine going into your kitchen and, okay, in your kitchen you might have things like saucepans, you might have a dishwasher, you might, um, uh, if you're British, you have a kettle because you need a cup of tea at five o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you've got all these single-purpose machines sitting around, you've got a mixing machine. But the idea that you could get your dishwasher to do your mixing, I mean, it's just absurd, isn't it? The idea that, uh, you know, you could get the coffee machine to make a cup of tea, it has been tried in the United States, and I guarantee to you that the results, <laughs> the res the results are unsatisfactory. What you need, what you're really after here is a universal reprogrammable machine that can do anything. You just feed in some punched tape and then suddenly the thing becomes a dishwasher. Isn't that fantastic? And, and it was that fantastic, the idea that you could have a multi-purpose machine whose function is changed according to the program you feed it. It was quite extraordinary. And that idea didn't descend on Alan Turing from the heavens like a Higgs boson, whatever sort of weird particle thing. It came because Max Newman had used this critical phrase in this, in this uh, presentation he was giving. So, you know, it's very interesting. This leads on to Alan Turing's next encounter with a seriously great man. This is Ludwig Wittgenstein. It turns out that Wittgenstein was uh, spending some time, quite a considerable number of years actually, in, in Cambridge in the uh, 1930s. And because Alan Turing sort of got into this, these questions of mathematical logic, and there was this whole question which came out of the paper on the Entscheidung's problem, which proved that there was no litmus test um, uh, for, for things. So there was this question about, well, there are going to be these unprovable theorems. And Wittgenstein, being a philosopher, was interested in sort of language and, and logical concepts, starts uh, does a whole series of seminars, and there are about 12 or 15 seminars in his series where he's, he's actually inviting his students and, and anyone else who wants to come along to consider things like whether there is any value in negative information. And this is directly connected with some of the concepts that Alan Turing was exploring in his um, uh, paper on computable numbers and the Entscheidungs problem. And Wittgenstein is a great guy. He's, he's using Alan Turing, he's sitting in the front row of his, his seminars as a, as a foil. And he says, Mr. Turing believes so-and-so. And, uh, and, then, and then Turing stands up and says, well, actually, no, that's not quite true. You know? <laughs> but uh, but this, is, this is great. And, and, and actually, there's a, the, there's the, the transcripts of these seminars um, have survived, and uh, so you can actually sort of see the Turing Wittgenstein dialogues going on. Wittgenstein doing crazy things like drawing a smiley face on the board and saying, This is Professor Smith. What is the difference between Professor Smith and this? You know, and it's, it's just absolutely hilarious. But he's constantly using Alan Turing as his sort of, as his foil. It's like a Socratic dialogue, but with other people participating. I mean, it's, it's, it's really very interesting stuff. But this, this is quite significant. We'll come back to the power of negative information uh, in just a second. The other thing that Alan Turing's working on in the 1930s, he's thinking about algorithms. I mean, you know, that's the kind of thing that we do, isn't it? You know, most of us think of a couple of algorithms while we're having our coffee over breakfast in the morning. Yeah. Now, Alan Turing's thinking about algorithms, and the reason he's thinking about algorithms is he's invented this concept. It's still a concept. There's no machinery involved. He's got this concept of this programmable machine. And a programmable machine is useless without the programs. And what a program is, it's just another way of saying an algorithm. It's a, it's a process that you apply to things. And so he's starting to think about um, uh, 
what you can what you can actually turn into a program, and and he's got into into the uh, game of Go. You know, I mean, you all know, you'll, you've probably all played it, but uh, you know, Japanese game with little black and white characters you put on the corners of uh, of a grid. Um, and so he's spending time, and he needs somebody to talk to his ideas about. And the one, the interesting thing about the Go algorithm is that uh, he's picked on the mother of his deceased best friend. So that's um, the lady who's uh, in this picture. She's, she's rather elegant. Um, and this is, this is by um, a, a famous British painter called um, Paget. But uh, um, she's very well connected in the arts world, but she's also very well connected in the science world. And, so she and Alan Turing, this is years after Alan Turing's best friend Christopher had died, she's having conversations with Alan about, well, he tries, he tries out the Entscheidung's problem business with her, and I think that's kind of a bit beyond her, and that's not really too much of a surprise. But he, he then goes and starts talking about whether you can make a sort of a rule set for, for playing Go. And she's never played Go. So, and these drawings on the right-hand side of the slide are from his correspondence, his letters to her. So he's sort of set out in his letter, he set out what he thinks the rules for Go on, what the algorithm should be. And I think this is really quite interesting because it's only like last year that they've actually managed to get a computer program to play Go, which I think is, uh, I think that's, that's all, that's, that's quite a nice, nice little vignette there. Um, so he's talking to Mrs. Morecambe about algorithms, which I think, poor lady, she was uh, one of great patients, but uh, she was a good games player, so she was probably quite interested. And then, of course, we come to World War II and Alan Turing's most famous, most well-known uh, uh, achievement, which is breaking the uh, Enigma machine. And again, if you watch a certain movie, then you might well get the sense that, um, again, this is another one of these sort of manna from heaven kind of events, you know, sort of um, Alan Turing working alone and without any interaction with... Uh, his co-workers suddenly has this sort of brilliant idea for a universal programmable machine that will actually be able to tell you what the settings on the Enigma machine are. The story is a bit more complicated than that. The story begins in the late 1920s when the chap in the middle of this slide, Marian Rievsky, was hired along with two other um, Polish mathematicians from the University of Poznan uh, to set up an embryonic uh, mathematical code-breaking unit within the Polish army. And in 1932, Rejewski was set to work on uh, the Enigma cipher, and Marian Rejewski, who, again, is one of the unsung heroes of 20th century mathematics, uh, managed to, from the basis of uh, a load of intercepted radio traffic, uh, from a commercial Enigma machine so that he knew what the rough architecture of it was, uh, and uh, from two uh, manuals that were provided by a German spy to the French. Equipped with only this information, Marian Rievsky managed to re reverse engineer the entire wiring of the inside of the Enigma machine, including the three rotors that were in use. Bearing in mind that each rotor has 26 factorial permutations of the way that you can wire it, this was really one of the world's most astonishing achievements. Rievsky then went on to uh, saying, well, it's all very well to reverse engineer the piece of hardware, but the real problem, as you saw from the Imitation Game movie, if you've seen it, is uh, knowing what the daily settings are, uh, which can be up to, I think it's 159 million, million, million different ways you can set up the machine every day. Uh, so that's really quite a large number. Um, and uh, so how do you actually, you can't do a uh, brute force attack on that and go through all the, all, all the possibilities. So how do you get it down to a reasonable number to test. And so he invented this machine that you can see a drawing of on the right there, which is called the Bomber. Um, and don't ask me why it was called the Bomber. Well, you can ask that as part of the questions if you like, and we can have a long and interesting conversation about it. But anyway, this machine was just designed to try and select some likely settings by testing some 
uh, it was to do with the uh, initial sequence of letters they used uh, in, in the beginning of the message, but, uh, the, but the point was that he's actually got a machine, and you can see from that drawing that you've got three rotors sitting on the top of the machine. So it's actually, what it's going to do is to go through all 17,576 permutations of three rotors in each 26 positions, yeah, 26 cubed, uh, and, um, uh, and then it will, it will stop and the little light bulb lights up when it thinks it's found one of the settings at which, uh, where, where the, uh, which could be the right setting for the day. And the idea was that a machine can just plow through at least the brute force part of it uh, and what you then have to do is to find a sensible test for the machine to work out whether it's a, whether it's a likely setting that's worth pursuing further. I think this is all quite interesting because when the Poles shared this technology and their work that they had done with the French and the British just before the war broke out in July 1939, they shared all this stuff. They didn't give it to Alan Turing, they gave it to one of his Bletchley Park co-workers called Dilly Knox. Um, but Knox comes straight back to the UK and tells Turing everything that he has learned from his visit to Poland. And Turing uses the principles that Rievsky has developed, and he uses them to build this thing, which is the British bomb, and you can see you've got the same idea. Although the three rotors are not sitting in on the top of the machine, and there's a lot more of them, but you can see that there are these banks of three rotors. These are mimicking the behavior of the three rotors inside the Enigma machine. They're going through all 17,576 permutations. And they can get through those permutations. This is in late 1939, electromechanical technology. They get through them in about 11 and a half minutes. This is a phenomenal piece of machinery. Um, this is a recent, it's a modern replica of Turing's um, 1939 bomb. And it's on display at Pletchley Park. And you can go and see daily demos of it and ask technical questions to the very enthusiastic volunteers who would like to tell you everything they know about it. But, uh, uh, but um, I think this is very interesting because actually what's happening here is the thing that Wittgenstein was half sort of jokingly struggling with, which is the power of negative information. Because what the machine does is it tests for uh, essentially correspondence between a guessed at piece of plain text. So, the Germans, for reasons that are still beyond me, used to encipher the weather forecast. I mean, why the weather forecast should be a secret, I do not know. But anyway, so the, they used to encipher the weather forecast. Helpfully, they would use a sort of like a word like Wetter for Hair Saga at the beginning to tell the recipients that this was the weather forecast message. So that's great. So you've got a great long German word that you can test for at the beginning of, uh, of an intercepted message. You think, well, if that's the plain text and this is the intercept, what we can do is ask the machine to stop when it's found a possible setting which would convert each of the letters in Vetter for Hair Saga into this rubbish that we have intercepted over the radio. So you're testing for, a, for um, correspondence. It's got to be the same, same setup to convert all those letters in the message to all those observed intercepts. So that's why you've got so many of these Enigma machines in this, or fake Enigma machines in this, in this bomb, because you're testing at lots of different positions in the same message. It's basically Rievsky's idea, but it's Rievsky's idea blown up a hundredfold, and it's much faster, and it's much slicker, and it's much more versatile than Rievsky's machine. And the great thing is this is actually programmable. It's a single purpose machine, but around the back of it, there's a complex set of wiring where you set it up for a different run every time. You reprogram it with a different, what they call a menu, to uh, test for a different set of settings on different messages. And it's, a, it's a very clever and interesting thing. This is not work that Alan Turing was doing on his own, though. He's not only inspired by Rievsky, but he's also doing it with a team of other guys at Bletchley Park and, uh, and, f and it's also very important to point out that he wasn't the engineer. And there was a very um, talented uh, engineer called Doc Keane who um, was able to effectively translate Alan Turing's concepts into blueprints and then build the 
um, engineering solution, that thing that you can see on the slide. So this was this this was a piece of teamwork. Oh, and incidentally, again, for those of you who watched the imitation game, this was all, this work was all done by the end of 1939, not not somehow sort of you know just after Pearl Harbor or whatever the uh, movie might lead you to believe. But um, I can't really leave the story of Bletchley Park without mentioning Joan Clark. Joan Clark, who was briefly engaged to um, Alan Turing. Um, before they had a sort of somewhat awkward conversation about his sexuality. Um, uh, but that's Joan Clark. She was a very impressive mathematician in her own right. She was not recruited through crossword puzzles. She was recruited because uh, she was a very, very bright math student at Cambridge University, and she was just the kind of professor type that they were looking for uh, to hire at Bletchley Park. They did have a real... Um, gender struggle at Bletchley Park because, of course, code breakers were men and women were um, things like translators and um, uh, operators of machinery. And so they couldn't make her a code breaker, of course, because that, wouldn't, that, wouldn't, that wasn't allowed. So what they had to do is to make her a translator to be able to give her an adequate sort of salary that was commensurate with the contribution that she was making. And she said that, that the best thing was filling in her application form for the translator role that she had been given. So she had this sort of reverse engineer the bureaucracy. So she had, so question one is post applied for, translator. Um, question two, language skills, none. <laughs> so Joan, 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 Joan Clark's quite a character. Um, Everybody at Bletchley was very upset when the engagement came to an end and, and so forth. But uh, um, uh, I just want to mention the document on the left here as well, which is, um, this is something that's known as Prof's Book. So Alan Turing, never a professor, acquired the nickname Prof when he was, uh, when he was at Bletchley. And you'll probably get the sense that it uh, meant that everyone thought he was the sort of epitome of the eccentric professor. And Prof's Book. Um, this was essentially a training manual, which it's not dated, but we think he probably um, wrote it in probably early 1940, which was a time when Bletchley Park was ma manically recruiting people to work on Enigma. Um, and so they needed to have some kind of, you know, effectively a Bible that they could go and refer to, which would tell you everything you know about how Enigma works and what the techniques are known at that time for uh, breaking it. So. Um, this is the front page, and actually, the front page is actually quite neat and tidy. Um, and you can see that he, he, he's actually rather carefully crossed out his typing mistakes in, in various places. So this, clearly, this is a classic example of Alan Turing's own, own effort with a typewriter. When you get onto about page 25, it's deteriorated a bit. This page is quite neat and tidy. But there's a, there's a possibility that it was for people like Joan that uh, Alan Turing wrote, the, wrote, this, uh, wrote this paper. Um, I've also put up a, a site plan of Bletchley Park as it was in 1943, um, and this gives you a real sense as to how industrialized the place had come by them, starting from being uh, a mansion building and a few wooden huts. Um, in 1939, 1940. By 1943, you can see all, all those, what look like industrial buildings towards the top of the picture. They're industrial buildings. They are very unattractive um, and they're made of sort of brick and concrete and they're bomb proof, which means actually if you, well, in the 1980s when they did this sort of thing, somebody tried to knock one of them down and found it was really, really hard to do because because they were actually designed to be bomb proof. Um, but, what you've got the sense of here is that Bletchley Park has moved from being something which is about code breakers doing clever things with things like Enigma to actually a process. It's standard methodology. It's an industrial uh, site now where you, know, you take the intercepts, you find the settings, you decode the messages, you turn them into intelligence, and then you report to the military. That's a different kind of thing from what they were doing in 1939, 1940. And, uh, it means that somebody like Alan Turing, who's really not, you know, he's not a factory manager. He's, a, um, he's got different skills. There's the, the role for people like him is, is more diminished at that time. And he's starting to think about a whole load of other things. He's, uh, 
he's moving on and thinking about, because they've done all these amazing technical things at Planetary Park, he's actually thinking about turning a universal computing machine from a concept into a reality. And so immediately after World War II, there's this big rush to get the talent that's worked in engineering and understands about um, machinery that has computational potential and get them to work for one of the few big projects that were going on there. So there's two or three going on here in the US and there were two or three going on in the UK. And these had all evolved out of the um, uh, effort that was being put into code breaking um, or in the case of the US, into solving equations for the Manhattan Project uh, during World War II. And it's, and so it's very, very interesting. So Alan Turing was scooped up in 1945 when the war was over by the National Physical Laboratory to design and build Britain's universal programmable electronic computing machine. There was a debate that took place in a committee as to whether the country would need possibly two computing machines, um, but, uh, so, but they thought they'd start with, start with one. They just couldn't imagine there'd be enough ballistics calculations to do to occupy two computing machines. Um, the laboratory was headed by a chap called Sir Charles Darwin. He was actually the grandson of the Charles Darwin that you've heard of, um, and that's him there in, in, in this picture. And um, the problem with... Uh, state-run projects is that they are state-run projects and they tend to proceed at the pace of the slowest bureaucrat in the convoy. Uh, and so Alan Turing completed his design for, he had a sneak preview of John von Neumann's um, paper on computer architecture, uh, but he completed his um, design paper on the uh, National Physical Laboratory's computing machine by late 1945. It didn't get built until 1959, which was five years after Alan Turing had died. Um, that picture there, uh, which is an absolutely splendid picture from the Science Museum archive in the, in the UK, is the uh, computing machine in question when it was half built. It's called the Automatic Computing Engine, and you can see just how enormous it was. That's a double height room that it was in, and you can see these huge racks of, uh, uh, of, of kits that it was... Uh, yeah, going to be made of, and it was quite, quite an extraordinary thing. But as I say, it didn't get built for all these years, so what was Alan going to do? Um, and he certainly got very frustrated about it. Um, well, number one, just as a sort of little interlude, he, he took up long distance running around about this time, and they actually became quite good at it. Um, so uh, there he is coming, at, he's running in a race there which took place, I think, probably 1946, Christmas 1946, I should think, uh, and he's, uh, he, came, he came second in a five-mile race. But in those days, they gave the runners handicaps so that uh, if you were good, then uh, uh, you set off behind the, the runners who were sort of, you know, essentially, it's a bit like, bit like um, handicaps in golf. So, uh, um, so he was... Um, he was running off scratch, which means that he was right at the back, uh, and uh, he was beaten by one yard by some other chap who had had a 50-yard start on him. So, that was, so he, was quite, he, was quite, he was quite pleased with coming second in, in, in that one. That's, that's him running halfway around. Um, and then you've got an example of an official program um, where you know, his, his name appears as one of, one of the runners in it. So he was doing that, but he was also doing some intellectual stuff as well, which I think is quite interesting. And in particular, he's doing it with these two guys that he'd met at Bletchley Park. Um, the one on the left is Donald Mickey, who subsequently became professor, I can't say it, professor of artificial intelligence at Edinburgh University. Um, and Mickey was working on the Colossus machine at Bletchley Park. And Mickey and Turing would go off to the pub and they would try and work out whether it was actually possible to write an algorithm so that you, you, the computing machine that they were all going to build after the war had finished would actually be able to play a game of chess. And they actually wrote these algorithms um, and uh, there were two bunches of um, mathematicians who had uh, 
written chess playing algorithms and they played chess against each other. They played, the algorithms played each other. But the way this did, because they were all scattered all over the country, so what they would do is they'd use the algorithm to work out what the next move was, which was probably like four and a half hours of sort of really quite detailed calculation and, and, and processing. And then they put their move into the post and sent it to the other, the other team who would then, then, then move a piece on the board and then work out what, they were go what their algorithm was going, going to do and then send it back. So, so I don't think this game of chess ever came to a conclusion, <laughs> but, uh, um, but it's all, it's all quite, quite interesting. So Turing's algorithm was co-written with a friend of his from Cambridge called uh, David Champernat, and their, their algorithm was called the Turo Champ. And Mickey's algorithm was written by, with a fellow Bletchley Parker called uh, Jack Good. And so theirs was called the, uh, oh no, it wasn't. It was written with uh, Sean Wiley. That's right. And so it was, called, it was called the Machiavelli, which was Mickey and Wiley, sort of slightly mispronounced. So, um, okay. And the, the other chap here, I've got here is uh, Alan Turing's best friend, Robin Gandhi, who he met during World War II. Um, and it was while he was sort of, uh, uh, I'm not sure why he was actually living with Robin Gandhi, but it was a sort of a time when they were sort of very um, closely associated that uh, Alan Turing actually wrote his paper on the Turing test, you know, the, the imitation game, the qu question whether machines can think. He was doing all this at the time because basically Darwin wasn't building the damn machines and there wasn't anything for him to do. So he was getting into this whole question about artificial intelligence and whether machines could think and sort of what defines thinking and all that kind of stuff. And so um, Robin was actually around when um, uh, Alan was writing his paper, and he said that Alan Turing absolutely hated writing papers. He absolutely hated the tedium of it, and sort of, you know, the, the need to sort of express yourself in a way that sort of pulls it back to, you know, filling in the gaps. You don't know what gaps other people have got. You don't know what will, what they will struggle with to get to the next logical milestone in the argument. So he found he found sort of working out which bits you needed to say and which bits you didn't need to say, sort of very, very challenging. But the great thing about the imitation game paper, the one that's called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, it wasn't put in a mathematical journal. This was something that went into a psychology journal. And it's got basically no equations in it. And it's, and it's just, uh, it, just free-form prose. And he said, Robin said, this is the only paper that Alan Turing actually enjoyed writing. And he was actually laughing while he was doing it. So, uh, so that's, um, I think that's quite, that's quite a nice little story. Unfortunately, let's enter the picture. Sir Geoffrey Jefferson, Britain's leading brain surgeon. Je Sir Geoffrey, a very impressive individual um, who had... Uh, learnt his brain surgery skills on wounded soldiers during World War I and then towards the end of his career had had to redeploy all his skills on wounded soldiers in World War II. Sir Geoffrey Jefferson is no mean intellect and he was a professor of uh, neuroscience at Manchester University which is where Alan Turing by this stage, we've got to 1949 now, um, was doing his work in Max Newman's computing laboratory. Yes, Max Newman. So Max Newman's there throughout every point in Alan Turing's life. He was at Bletchley Park as well. So Max Newman had set up a computing laboratory, invited Alan Turing to come and work in it, and this is where he meets Jefferson. Jefferson's a bit offended to find out what's going on because these mathematicians and engineers who are working in the... Um, uh, building just up the, up the road from where Jefferson works, apparently building something they're calling an electronic brain. And he finds this a thoroughly offensive idea. And then he finds out that people are writing idiots like Turing, are writing papers on things like, can machines think? And he uh, says, so, okay, stop, stop. Let's take a time out. Jefferson, because he's the leading brain surgeon, is given one of uh, the UK's most prestigious medical awards. He's, he's awarded the Lister Medal. And uh, when you're awarded the Lister Medal, you're expected to go and give a speech in London. So, you know, there's a dinner and you're expected to give a speech. So Jefferson uses the opportunity of his speech to say, look, this is complete nonsense, this idea that machines can think. You can't talk about things that are made of wires and vacuum tubes as thinking. That's, that's a, it's, it's an offense to the language. Um, and he says it's only really when you can 
get to the completely fantastic idea of a computer doing something like, say, writing a sonnet that you could actually talk of it as thinking. The Times newspaper thought this was the best thing they'd heard of for ages, because first of all, they're absolutely fascinated you know, by sort of the Dan Dare idea of somebody, somebody who's making an electronic brain. And then you've got the country's leading brain surgeon saying that uh, this, this is complete, completely ghastly. So they phone up the computing laboratory in Manchester. Unfortunately, Max Newman, who would have fielded this with sort of suavity and, uh, and uh, urbanity, he's out of the country. So the person who picks up the phone is Alan Turing. And this is, this is, this is not, not very good for, for the reputation of Man Manchester University because um, um, Alan Turing says, well, I'll, I'll, you won't be able to read it. It's just under the picture of Jefferson. It says, Mr. Turing said yesterday, this is only a foretaste of what is to come and only the shadow of what is going to be. We've had some experience with the machine. Before we, well, we need to have some experience with the machine before we really know its capabilities. It may take years before we settle down to the new possibilities, but I don't see why it should not enter any of the fields normally covered by the human intellect and uh, eventually compete on equal terms. So this is pretty offensive, particularly if you're very re of a religious sort of mindset. But, uh, and then, then he goes on to say, I don't think you can even draw the line about sonnets, though the comparison is perhaps a little bit unfair, because a sonnet written by a machine will be better appreciated by another machine. <laughs> so, Newman gets back from Dublin and there's this sort of like media storm going on and uh, so poor old, poor old Newman has to pick up the pieces and write a very boring letter at the time saying, well, I'm sorry, but this machine that we've got, it's got a memory size of 1,000 and, uh, what is it, 1,024 bits. It's not actually going to write a sonnet just yet. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, so, but Newman, Newman deserves a load of credit. There's Newman again a bit later in life. Um, Newman um, had actually invented some, or found some mathematical problems that his tiny machine could uh, uh, work on. And um, uh, he, he, as I say, is one of, one of the most clever characters and things. Right, I'm now gonna move on to uh, the final phase of Alan Turing's work, which to the uneducated, and that definitely includes me, um, seems a very surprising departure from all the things he's been doing. So we've got this guy who's broken the Enigma code, he's written an Einstein's problem paper, he's designed computing machinery, uh, he's written software manuals, uh, but it, that's all in a particular sort of space within the scientific and mathematical world. What he spends the last four years of his life on is problems in developmental biology. And so it's not immediately obvious how you can get this quantum shift in discipline that he's working on. So how did that arise? How did that come about? What suddenly makes him get interested in the shape of horses? He wrote in his paper on the chemical basis of morphogenesis, which I'll come on to in just a second, he said, a horse is not a spherically symmetrical object. This is something that needs to be explained. A horse starts as a spherically symmetrical object when it's in the embryonic stage of its development. It's spherically symmetrical. It doesn't have a front. It doesn't have legs. It doesn't have a tail. How does it know which end is going to be the head and which end is going to be the tail? That is the kind of problem that I want to spend uh, the next few years working on. What? What's that got to do with computing machinery and intelligence and enigma and code breaking and you know, whatever? Again, I think part of the explanation, it's not the whole explanation, but part of the explanation is Newman. Newman's mathematical discipline is topology. Newman spent his entire time, I mean, he wrote the textbook. There is only one UK textbook on topology and it's written by Newman. Uh, and Newman is spending his time thinking about manipulating shapes and forms because that's what topologists do. And Turing has always been interested in this kind of thing. He's always interested in mathematical patterns in nature. And I don't, I think that it's actually because he's, he's been associated with Newman professionally for his entire life. And now they're working in the same building together. They've got, you know, their offices are 
pretty close to each other. So I think they're actually sparking ideas off each other the whole time. And Turing is beginning to think, hang on, maybe we can explain some of these phenomena that we see in biology using not just topology concepts, but we can actually talk about them in terms of chemicals diffusing across surfaces or, or through a 3D matrix. And so he comes up with some diffusion equations, which he's able to um, use to show things like, I mean, this is a pattern that's taken from, from, his, from his paper, which I've overlaid onto the um, uh, paper itself. But that, that's a sort of classic sort of pattern that you'd see on sort of black and white Frisian cows that you typically find in, find in the UK. Um, and he can actually get these equations to model patterns that are observed uh, in nature. And the way he's doing that does bring everything back together because what he's doing is he's getting the Manchester computer, and this has moved on from the proof of concept thing with only 1,024 bit memory size. Um, he's moved on to, um, it's, it's turned into a sort of big sort of shiny machine now with a decent memory and, uh, uh, and they can actually run some serious programs on it. What he's doing is he's getting the computer to um, do effectively a numerical analysis of his equations where he can point the points of concentration and the points of relative dilution of a uh, particular substance. And it's just, it's just using, putting the equation into the computer and then just feeding it with some sort of effectively some fake sample data to see how, how, the, how the equations come out. And then he's taken very laboriously a piece of squared paper. To fit it on the slide, I put it on sideways, but if you turn, turn your head in, sort of pretend you're watching an upside down tennis game, uh, then you, you can see that each of the squares on the square paper, Alan Turing has written two characters in which are the characters that come out of the computer for that particular data point. So he's basically making a contour map here, and then he's colored it in to see where the points of intense chemical might, might lie. So you're getting a sort of a pattern emerging from that. And this is what he was doing. Towards the end of his life, he'd moved from doing animal biology into plant biology, and he was trying to do things like explain uh, the spiral patterns that you see. Uh, in, if you've ever studied very closely uh, a flower of a daisy, the little yellow bit in the middle is not a uniform yellow bit. It's lot, got tiny, lots of tiny, tiny florets in them that are arranged in spiral patterns, just as you see in the um, seeds in a in a sunflower. So there's this. Uh, so he's trying to explain those patterns. And this this rather strange thing that looks like you're looking down the mouth of a cannon. Um, this is the growth tip of. Um, uh, some sort of stem of something. I mean, I, I typically, you know, this could be the growth point at the center of the spiral in the sunflower, but I typically think of this as being the uh, growth point of the tip of an uh, asparagus shaft, because what you're seeing is the, you know, when you look at an asparagus uh, stalk, you can see all those little sort of triangular bits which are going to turn into branches or leaves when the, when the thing grows a bit bigger and it's got too nasty to eat. Uh, the, um, the, the, all these, these spots are emerging just at the point where they're going to, they're going to turn into, into, those, um, into those branches or, or those, um, what do you call them, nodes in, uh, in the plant. So, so what he's got there is he's got a, a, a growth zone just around the uh, center of the tip and you can see the growth points emerging and he's trying to predict the positioning of these uh, points using, using his di diffusion equations. Alan Turing's biographers love the picture on the right because that was done by my grandmother in, uh, at a time when Alan Turing was still at uh, uh, his primary school. So he's about um, probably about 11 years old in that picture. That's my grandmother's quite a talented artist and so she's just done this sketch of watching Alan playing hockey, or rather not playing hockey, uh, um, and she's called the picture hockey or watching the daisies grow, um, and says Alan peering intently at a daisy 
the last paper that Alan Turing was working on at the time he died was about the growth and form of the daisy and uh, it's an unf unfinished, unfinished piece of work. But uh, um, there's a sort of a nice symmetry in that. So it does imply that he was interested in this whole growth and form thing for the whole of his life. And uh, uh, equipped with the computer, he was able to... Um, you know, come back and sort of make something of it uh, right at the end of his career. Okay, I'm just going to spend the last few minutes just um, bringing us back to Alan Turing's personal life. We've spent too much time in the last few minutes on technical stuff, and I, I want to just come back to his personal life and what he personally was thinking and going through in those difficult years after uh, he was uh, prosecuted for gross indecency. This is a copy of the indictment that uh, uh, is still there in the Chester County archives. Um, and you can see that because it took place in 1952, he was arrested two days after uh, George VI had uh, died. And so the, what they've had to do is they've had to cross out the King versus Alan Matheson Turing and Arnold Murray, and they've typed in the Queen versus Alan Turing. So it shows, just captures, captures the moment of it. Um, and we could spend some time talking about that, but uh, rather than waste time now, I'll allow you to do that during the questions if you want to cover it. But uh, I think this, this I find very interesting. These are postcards. There's only three out of the set of four that have survived that uh, Alan Turing wrote to Robin Gandhi early in 1954. And these are messages from the unseen world. And they're almost sort of psychedelic. They're a completely different facet of his character. And they're also quite witty. Um, so um, number three, the universe is the interior of the light cone of creation. Well, there's quite a lot to think about in that. Number four, science is a differential equation. Religion is a boundary condition. <laughs> number five, um, lots, lots of people love this one, um, hyperboloids of wondrous light, rolling for a through space and time, harbor those waves which somehow might play out God's holy pantomime. This was written within three months of his death. Um, but then we got some other stuff down here, number eight. And number eight's, I think on the whole, number eight's probably my favorite. Um, the exclusion principle, yeah, yeah you, all remember, you all remember your exclusion principle. Yeah, even those of you who are biologists remember the exclusion principle. Yeah. The exclusion principle is laid down primarily for the benefit of the electrons themselves, who might be corrupted and become dragons or demons if allowed to associate too freely. <laughs> now, is that a nod back to particles of similar charge uh, not being allowed to have relationships because if you do then you get sent to jail or something even worse happens to you. I, I think that I, I think there's, there's so much wit and fun in this stuff even if number five is perhaps a bit uh, um, a bit psychedelic and a bit tragic but anyway I, I love these I think I think these are absolutely fantastic. Okay so I'm not going to finish up on a interesting note. Um, I've talked to you about Alan Turing, who is the gentleman on the left, as I explained uh, to you before. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, go and see it. It's a great movie. Um, but I actually think that what's really very interesting and you can, is that we are beginning to see uh, a bit of a shift in the perception of Alan Turing as something a bit more than... Um, uh, uh, a gay icon, if you like, and we're actually seeing some really quite interesting stuff coming out of the technical press where people are rediscovering his um, chemical theories of morphogenesis, and there, there have been some experiments which have been reported within the last two years where people have actually um, discovered that some things which can't be explained by things like uh, uh, Lewis Wolpert's theories of, um, uh, uh, of developing organisms can be explained by Alan Turing's theories. And so he's actually sort of coming back up in the um, citations lists as uh, being, being somebody to pay attention to. So I, I have to say, I think that's, that's actually quite nice. This is, this is good for me because I suspect that he would never, wanted, would never have wanted to be sort of remembered for 
you know, being prosecuted and pardoned and all that kind of stuff. What I think he would have wanted to be remembered for is actually what he contributed to the body of knowledge. And so I think it's actually really quite, it's really quite nice to see some of that, that uh, um, stuff which is less well known about his work sort of coming to the fore again. So that's a, that's a, that's a good note to finish on. And um, I'd like to thank you for listening so patiently. on. Uh, we do have some time for questions. Do we have any questions? Perhaps say, um, yes, go ahead. What is, is known about, I guess what I want to know is the psychiatric history in, in the sense of was he subject to depression? Um, did he have or was he consistently able to work or at times had to stop? Um, well, I, I can't give you a good answer to your question, which is a very, very good one. Um, I don't believe that Alan was subject to depression during his life. So I do think that something, something happened in the 1950s. But um, despite some attempts to study the literature on the subject, I still believe that it is not properly understood what happens when you give a male person uh, an implant of synthetic estrogen, which they have to carry around for a year, and how that screws you up psychologically, uh, to my mind, can only be imagined. I mean, I have, I have sort of done some trawls to find some papers on it, but frankly what I found I didn't find particularly edifying and I uh, probably just wasn't looking in the right place. Um, but uh, it seems to me to be sort of a fairly sound prediction, subject to any of you knowing of some papers which actually tackle this subject properly, um, that it's likely to screw you up. And so if he was suffering from depression after having that implant and even what the lasting effects might have been after the implant was taken out, I don't know. I mean, there were certainly physiological effects because he actually wrote about them, uh, but whether there were psychological effects as well, I wouldn't be at all surprised. And I think if you couple that with boyfriend trouble, which I actually believe that he had right at the end of his life, the sort of... Um, Profile, I mean, there's probably no standard profile of somebody who is suicidal, but um, again, what I've read about sort of what makes people um, commit suicide, I think there are enough, uh, if you like, sort of factors that you would find in a typical suicidal pattern to find it um, explainable what, what actually happened right at the end of his life. I don't think you need to have years of depression or years of um, uh, a psychological uh, history. That's not a necessary condition for being sui suicidal. Um, uh, I mean, it may be, may be a common pattern, but it's not a necessary condition. So, so I, I think the psychology of Alan Turing is actually quite tough. Um, uh, and uh, I think one thing that is quite interesting is that he had a very good and strong relationship with his um, therapist, because one of the conditions of him not being sent to prison in 1952 was that he should have something called treatment. Um, what treatment, what the judge thought treatment was and what the lawyers thought treatment was was basically being sent off for some psychotherapy. So they found him a nice therapist and, uh, and, and that, was a, that was a very good and I think positive relationship, and this is based on what Alan himself said about it, so I think, think that's a fairly, fairly high quality source of information. So I think th that, that was all, I, I think, think quite, quite good and not indicating that he was fundamentally sort of psychologically at risk, if you like, um, uh, earlier, earlier in his life. Um, what I think took everybody by surprise was that some medics came along and decided that treatment included a bit more than psychotherapy and it needed some kind of um, sexuality reversal therapy which they were going to do by giving him female hormones. 
And the papers on that, the papers, I mean, if you want to have a good comedy sort of, you know, two or three hours and you're bored in the library one day, I do encourage you to go and read what the medics and the psychologists wrote in the 1950s about homosexuality and uh, what kind of a disease it was and how it could be cured and all that kind of stuff. It's mind-blowing. I mean, it's seriously mind-blowing. It's written by people from another planet. <laughs> Yeah, um, anyway, so I'm sorry, that's a very long and, and rambling answer to your question. <laughs> you said he had a good relationship with his therapist, so it wasn't what we would call today conversion therapy. Was his therapist sympathetic to his homosexuality, or does he, he say in his writings? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it's difficult to know because... Uh, None of the records of the therapy have survived, as you might expect. But um, uh, he was a um, German-trained Jungian psychologist who fled um, Germany uh, before the war, as you might expect. He was Jewish and uh, um, uh, had set up practice in, in Manchester. And he went through all the standard things that you'd expect a you know, 1950s Jungian therapist to do. So he made... Alan write down his dreams. He talked to him about his relationship with his mother. Uh, you know, I mean, did, he did all that kind of stuff. The stuff about the relationship with the mother was scary, but, uh, the, but um, you know, and I, and I think, and I think it was all quite um, uh, non-judgmental. I think that was the, I think that was the point, and uh, uh, and it was all about making Alan feel more at ease with himself which in a climate where being yourself involves being a criminal is not, not an easy task. So, uh, but uh, I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, he'd, he'd go around and play with the kids. There's, so the therapist had two daughters and, you know, Alan loved kids. So he'd, he'd go and play with the kids and, you know, he's invited to dinner and stuff. This is not like, this is a bit more than a normal sort of, you know, you, know, you, you pay for your hour and then, and then you get the bus home. It's, uh, it, was, it was a bit more of a relationship than that. When you began talking about morphogenesis, I assume where you were going with that was as a program being run or an algorithm being run that develops this complicated forms rather than diffusion equations um, and gradients interfering or interacting. Did he ever discuss morphogenesis as a program or an algorithm being run? Um. It's possible, and this is where my technical abilities let me down. Um, he, he only published one paper on the morphogenesis thing, which is the chemical theory paper that I showed you, though he did write at least two other papers, and his working papers that um, were uh, left when, when he died indicate that there may even have been other stuff that he was going to work on. Now, those are scrappy and require a great deal of interpretation to um, understand what he was doing and how far he'd got. Um, Professor Jonathan Swinton in the UK has done a lot of work on uh, understanding those and interpreting Alan's drawings, which are actually very attractive, very interesting. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and we also know that Turing was writing a load of routines for the Manchester computer, which were to do with um, modeling um, some of these chemical behaviors. But I'm not sure that any of that, I mean, I think that just repeats your question back to me rather than, rather than actually ans answers it. So, I mean, it may be that Swinton knows, you know, I mean, he, if anybody could give you a proper answer, it would be, it would be him. I suspect he might say no, but, um, uh, but he's actually done things like gone through the routines that Alan Turing was writing for the computer. So he might say the answer is yes, because those, those routines are doing the thing that you, you've just described. So I'm, 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 it's possible. I think, I think it's a terrible shame, because I think this, is, this uncompleted piece of work would have just been so interesting. Um, and, it, and it's actually attractive, possibly because it's n not completed, but I think because all oh, you guys got obsessed with DNA in about the mid-1950s, mid only to these, uh, these two guys called Watson and Crick and sort of suddenly suddenly that shifted the agenda for all of us and we stopped thinking about sort of uh, if you like macrobiology in the sense of growth and form and started thinking about nanobiology and uh, uh, um, 
So that's why it's quite interesting that recently people have rediscovered macrobiology and find it finding it a bit more interesting. But, uh, all right, sorry, I'm going, going off on one now. It's time for another question. <laughs> Are there any more questions? A lot of computer geeks would like to think that if Alan Turing had lived, he would have been Steve Jobs in 1963. <laughs> um, and, um, but from your research, it's kind of sounding like that might not have been the case, that he was going off in a different direction and would not have had you know, a home computer 20 years, 40 years earlier. I agree. I, I, I think Alan Turing had got left computers behind. Computers were tools now. They weren't... Uh, um, uh, they weren't you know, the whole sort of idea of design um, was like the previous decade's problem. And uh, Alan Turing wasn't a particularly good computer designer, actually. I mean, some, some of the things, some of his designs are very elegant, uh, but they have a mathematical purity which sometimes clashes with engineering pragmatism. Uh, let, me give, let me give you an example. So the, one of the computer projects going on in post-war Britain was going on at Cambridge University with uh, those of you who are familiar with um, academic rivalry will know that there is sort of like genteel enmity between uh, people of a certain opinion and people of a certain uh, opposing opinion. And uh, um, another mathematician who graduated same year as Alan Turing from uh, uh, Cambridge University and also became one of the country's leading computer scientists, a guy called Professor Sir Maurice Wilkes, um, so Maurice Wilkes and Alan Turing could not stand each other. Maurice Wilkes was the um, head of the Cambridge Computing Laboratory, and uh, they had different philosophical approaches, they had different social backgrounds, so Alan Turing is very sort of upper middle class, um, sort of expat civil service background, and uh, uh, Wilkes' father was a, was a clerk that worked on a, worked on a small rural estate somewhere. So they got very, very different approaches to problems and Wilkes, quite rightly, um, believed that actually you shouldn't design your software with the limitations of the hardware in mind. And this is very important in the late 1940s because the real problem they had then, the real technical problem they had then was memory. And Alan Turing's idea for memory was that you would use these um, mercury delay line. So you take a meter long tube, or well you can use it as long as you like, but typically a meter long tube of mercury, and you send a sound wave up it, and a sound wave goes at walking pace through mercury, and it gets eventually gets to the end of the tube, and then it comes back and walks slowly back down to the other end while it's detected by a sensor, and suddenly you realize that the entire millisecond has gone by since you sent the signal down. So this is great, because you've actually managed to store the signal for the duration of it, what it, time it takes the, mercury, the sound wave to travel up mercury tube and back. So that's your mercury delay line. But it means that if you're using something physical like that as your uh, memory system, that your ability to compute depends on when that signal trots back slowly up to the sensor. You're, you have to have just-in-time uh, program writing to be able to capture the piece of data that you need as it, as it pops out of the delay line. You can't just have it at any random point in the program. So your program has to be very elegantly uh, configured so as to optimize uh, its performance relative to the constraints imposed upon you by the hardware. So Alan Turing wrote very sort of, um, uh, if you like, dictatorial computer programming manuals, which were all designed around the problems with the hardware. Wilkes, for all his faults, thought well, this, is, this is a rubbish way of going about doing things, that actually next year somebody will invent something much better than these terrible delay lines, and what you'll have is you'll be able to unplug the delay line part of the memory and, and put, in a, put in a modern memory, and therefore you can just write your software like you want to write your software, and, and that, will, that will be a better approach. So, you know, I think, I think that's quite interesting. But these kinds of problems have long been left behind by, uh, by the time... Um, uh, Alan Turing had sort of reached the end of his life. So, I mean, I think it's very interesting to speculate where he might have gone from developmental biology. I mean, who knows? He might have invented some entirely new science. Okay, well, I think, um, I think we should leave it there. I'm sure we'd all like to thank Sir Derbert again for a very 
um, interesting, fascinating talk. <laughs>